Section 13 of Whirly Gigs by O. Henry. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Sacrifice Hit The editor of the Hearthstone magazine has his own ideas about the selection of manuscript for his publication. His theory is no secret. In fact, he will expound it to you willingly, sitting at his mahogany desk, smiling benignantly, and tapping his knee gently with his gold-rimmed eyeglasses. The Hearthstone, he will say, does not employ a staff of readers. We obtain opinions of the manuscripts submitted to us directly from types of the various classes of our readers. That is the editor's theory, and this is the way he carries it out. When a batch of MSS is received, the editor stuffs every one of his pockets full of them and distributes them as he goes about during the day. The office employees, the hall porter, the janitor, the elevator man, messenger boys, the waiters at the cafe where the editor has luncheon, the man at the newsstand where he buys his evening paper, the grocer and the milkman, the guard on the 5.30 uptown elevated train, the ticket chopper at 60th Street, the cook and the maid at his home. These are the readers who pass upon MSS sent in to the Hearthstone magazine. If his pockets are not entirely emptied by the time he reaches the bosom of his family, the remaining ones are handed over to his wife to read after the baby goes to sleep. A few days later, the editor gathers in the MSS during his regular rounds and considers the verdict of his assorted readers. The system of making up a magazine has been very successful, and the circulation paced by the advertising rates, is making a wonderful record of speed. The Hearthstone Company also publishes books, and its imprint is to be found on several successful works, all recommended, says the editor, by the Hearthstone's army of volunteer readers. Now and then, according to talkative members of the editorial staff, the Hearthstone has allowed manuscripts to slip through its fingers on the advice of its heterogeneous readers that afterward proved to be famous sellers when brought out by other houses. For instance, the gossip says, the rise and fall of Silas Lantham was unfavorably passed upon by the elevator man. The office boy unanimously rejected the boss. In the bishop's carriage was contemptuously looked upon by the streetcar conductor. The deliverance was turned down by a clerk in the subscription department whose wife's mother had just begun a two-month's visit at his home. The Queen's Quare came back from the janitor with a comment, so is the book. But nevertheless, the hearthstone adheres to its theory and system, and it will never lack volunteer readers. For each one of the widely scattered staff, from the young lady stenographer in the editorial office to the man who shovels in coal, whose adverse decision lost to the hearthstone company, the manuscript of The Underworld has expectations of becoming editor of the magazine some day. This method of the Hearthstone was well known to Alan Slayton when he wrote his novelette entitled Love is All. Slayton had hung about the editorial offices of all the magazines so persistently that he was acquainted with the inner workings of every one in Gotham. He knew not only that the editor of the Hearthstone handed his MSS around among different types of people for reading, but that the stories of sentimental love interest went to Miss Puffkin, the editor's stenographer. Another of the editor's peculiar customs was to conceal invariably the names of the writers from the readers of MSS, so that a glittering name might not influence the sincerity of their reports. Slayton made Love Is All the effort of his life, he gave it six months of the best work of his heart and brain. It was a pure love story, fine, elevated, romantic, passionate, a prose poem that set the divine blessing of love, I am transposing from the manuscript, high above all earthly gifts and honors, and listed it in the catalogue of heaven's choicest rewards. Slayton's literary ambition was intense. He would have sacrificed all other worldly possessions to have gained fame in his chosen art. He would almost have cut off his right hand or have offered himself to the knife of the appendicitis fancier 
to have realized his dream of seeing one of his efforts published in the Hearthstone. Slayton finished Love is All and took it to the Hearthstone in person. The office of the magazine was in a large, conglomerate building presided under by a janitor. As the writer stepped inside the door on his way to the elevator, a potato masher flew through the hall, wrecking Slayton's hat and smashing the glass of the door. Closely following, in the wake of the utensil, flew the janitor, a bulky, unwholesome man, suspenderless and sordid, panic-stricken and breathless. A frowsy, fat woman with flying hair followed the missile. The janitor's foot slipped on the tiled floor. He fell in a heap with an exclamation of despair. The woman pounced upon him, seized his hair. The man bellowed lustily. The vengeance wrecked. The virago rose and stalked triumphant as Minerva back to some cryptic domestic retreat at the rear. The janitor got to his feet, blown and humiliated. This is married life, he said to Slayton, with a certain bruised humor. That's the girl I used to lay awake of, nights thinking about. Sorry about your hat, mister. Say, don't snitch to the tenants about this, will you? I don't want to lose my job. Slayton took the elevator at the end of the hall and went up to the offices of the Hearthstone. He left the MS of Love is All with the editor, who agreed to give him an answer as to its availability at the end of a week. Slayton formulated his great winning scheme on his way down. It struck him with one brilliant flash, and he could not refrain from admiring his own genius in conceiving the idea. That very night he set about carrying it into execution. Miss Puffkin, the Hearthstone stenographer, boarded in the same house with the author. She was an oldish, thin, exclusive, languishing, sentimental maid. Slayton had been introduced to her some time before. The writer's daring and self-sacrificing project was this. He knew that the editor of the Hearthstone relied strongly upon Miss Puffkin's judgment in the manuscript of romantic and sentimental fiction. Her taste represented the immense average of mediocre women who devour novels and stories of that type. The central idea and keynote of Love is All was love at first sight, the enrapturing, irresistible, soul-thrilling feeling that compels a man or a woman to recognize his or her spirit mate as soon as heart speaks to heart. Suppose he should impress this divine truth upon Miss Puffkin personally. Would she not endorse her new and rapturous sensations by recommending highly to the editor of the Hearthstone the novelette Love is All? Slayton thought so, and that night he took Miss Puffkin to the theater. The next night he made vehement love to her in the dim parlor of the boarding house. He quoted freely from Love is All, and he wound up with Miss Puffkin's head on his shoulder and visions of literary fame dancing in his head. But Slayton did not stop at lovemaking. This, he said to himself, was the turning point of his life, and, like a true sportsman, he went the limit. On Thursday night, he and Miss Puffkin walked over to the big church in the middle of the block and were married. Brave Slayton, Chateaubriand died in a garret. Byron courted a widow. Keats starved to death. Poe mixed his drinks. De Quincey hit the pipe. Aide lived in Chicago. James kept on doing it. Dickens wore white socks. De Maupassant wore a straight jacket. Tom Watson became a populist. Jeremiah wept. All these authors did things for the sake of literature. But thou didst cap them all. Thou marriedest a wife to carve for thyself a niche in the temple of fame. On Friday morning, Mrs. Slayton said she would go over to the Hearthstone office, hand in one or two manuscripts that the editor had given her to read, and resign her position as stenographer. "'Was there anything, er, that, that you particularly fancied in the stories you were going to turn in?' asked Slayton, with a thumping heart. "'There was one, a novelette, that I liked so much,' said his wife. "'I haven't read anything in years that I thought was half as nice and true to life.' That afternoon, Slayton hurried down to the Hearthstone office. He felt that his reward was close at hand. With a novelette in the Hearthstone, Literary reputation would soon be his. The office boy met him at the railing in the outer office. It was not for unsuccessful authors to hold personal colloquy 
with the editor except at rare intervals. Slayton, hugging himself internally, was nursing in his heart the exquisite hope of being able to crush the office boy with his forthcoming success. He inquired concerning his novelette. The office boy went into the sacred precincts and brought forth a large envelope, thick with more than the bulk of a thousand checks. The boss told me to tell you he's sorry, said the boy, but your manuscript ain't available for the magazine. Slayton stood dazed. Can you tell me, he stammered, whether or no, Miss Puff, that is, I mean Miss Puffkin, handed in a novelette this morning that she had been asked to read? She sure did, answered the office boy wisely. I heard the old man say that Miss Puffkin said it was a daisy. The name of it was Married for the Mazuma, or A Working Girl's Triumph. Say you, said the office boy confidentially. Your name's Slayton, ain't it? I guess I mixed up cases on you without meaning to do it. The boss give me some manuscript to hand around the other day, and I got the ones for Miss Puffkin and the janitor mixed. I guess it's all right, though. And then Slayton looked closer and saw on the cover of his manuscript, under the title Love is All, the janitor's comment scribbled with a piece of charcoal. The hell you say? End of A Sacrifice Hit